Salutations from space and aloha from earth. Is this thing on? This is Gemini Brett of More Than Astrology here with a starry telling to honor today's Gemini Venus square Pisces Neptune aspect. This is take three as I am battling um, some technical issues that have seemingly resulted perhaps from the Mark Zuckerberg trial in the relationship of Zoom video webinar and Facebook live streaming. If you can see this, perhaps you could write a little something in the comments below. I'm gonna take a second to share this to my business page, which is facebook.com slash arts of the chart. I'll hope you'll go over there and give it a like. I hope here as well, you'll like this video and, and share it around if you enjoy it. I'm gonna send this also over to the Cosmic Intelligence Agency of which I am a proud agent, 1123, kind of agent Fibonacci in that sense, I guess. Um, and also to the um, Astrology Hub Cafe. So cool, it sounds like it's happening looking at some of the comments below. Wonderful. Third time's the charm. Yes, three. The great Hermes tries majestus, thrice great. Thank you, sir. You may or may not know my computer's name also is three. But not only is third time the charm, but I had to go through this entirely wild process to get this going that the folks at Zoom have sorted out in this time of transition in their relationship with... Um, Facebook. And you know, I guess there's a little bit in the celestial symphony right now with the Aries Mercury squaring Capricorn Pluto that might have us expressing some anger in regards to our own individual expression and its relationship to the systems of rules. And that might even involve the coding of software. Um, and, you know, a time for us to get into the dream, Neptune, and even the delusion and disillusion, Neptune, of our relationships, Venus, with Gemini, so that they can be born anew, where we learn that be young, have fun, is the way of the light. Sun is also, speaking of light, um, where I am in Seattle right now at the Midheaven here in the south behind me with Jupiter below the ground at the north at the IC. And we're coming onto the time where um, Sun is opposite Jupiter. Uh, my friend Adam Gainsberg's um, verbiage for this sacred time of an outer planet's cycle, the solar opposition to the outer planet is midnight star. Because like a full moon, Jupiter will now rise at sunset, set at sunrise, and therefore culminate in the middle of the night, you know, dominating the sky. It's a very powerful time. It means that as Earth is passing Jupiter by, we are closest to Jupiter. He's brightest in our sky. And it's a really beautiful and powerful time. So Jupiter in Scorpio, as it has been since early October, 2017 and will be until November of this year, I think we're asking ourselves to put a little bit of the spotlight into the darkness and the hidden things and to look at some of these themes of power, which perhaps also Capricorn Saturn is exciting at this time. I like this word exciting, even reviving, rather than words that we hear in astrology like hits you know this planet is hitting mine now and this planet is squaring you know and it's an exact hit tomorrow or whatever i have many of these so-called hits happening now personally i might actually share some of that at the end of this because i'd like to speak about some astrological techniques with you um and i'll use myself as an example if we have time to go there but first um i was hoping to get into some story telling of the thing. 
All right, so it looks like we're live, we're streaming, it's happening, I've shared it around. I invite you again to share. You'll find an invite in the description here that if you'd like to give back for what you receive here, donations gladly accepted, whether it's just love and comments, likes and sharing this thing around, or if you're in a space where you choose to um, donate economically, you will find a donate button at my webpage, morethanastrology.com. And uh, you'll also find a services link there for booking private counsel or tutoring. Um, we spend a lot of time, we live streaming beings, sorting out the tech and doing these things. And it's been particularly frustrating of late. So anyone that wants to help me support the uh, cost of um, extending these sharings and teachings, it's greatly re received with gratitude so deepest bow to those of you who can support i recently quit my square part-time job and gone full-time astrologer so here's to that and also to some of the challenges that come alive with such um devotions right so on to the thing and some storytelling time and so so many of these Planets align in um, such a way that tales come to mind for me today. I want to say that I started um, with this song that came in just, I mean, I like to begin with music, as many of you know. And the song that showed up on the horn today um, is a song that I wrote, it looks like, four years ago about four years ago. I'd love to know the exact date so I could check the transit charts, but it's called Ballad for the Fishes. And um, you can see if you choose to, to go through my Facebook videos. In fact, I'll share that here. This strange thing where I was playing within a simulated aquarium. <laughs> um, but I'll tell you that that um, that song came in for me after I first attended here in Seattle, a really wonderful ceremonious ecstatic dance that was happening every month for a long time called dream dance. And I think that is in and of itself, I can see why this kind of Neptunian aquarium <laughs> fish vibe came in. Well, also perhaps Mercury in Aries, you know, breaking out of this square to Pluto and Capricorn. And there's been the alignments with Mercury, three alignments to square Saturn and Capricorn, like breaking out of the out of the the aquarium, you know, cage so we can swim again full on in the oceans. And so I just remember I got home that night, you know, late after that dance dream dance um which was held for a long time by a very beautiful and powerful woman here in seattle named nina and um it began with um yoga and some live music and i play in, in the band sonic shiva speaking also of pisces or at least the trident that shiva holds um and then kind of a beautiful um, procession and drum and then sitting together to kind of anchor into our intentions for the dance. And I'd often pour tea at um, Dream Dance. And at some point, once the DJ comes in and it starts very mellow and picks up and there's these live drummers, amazing drummers that would come in and light the space up. And at the end of the night, the DJs would bring us back down. And people literally would come down to the ground in Shavasana. And, um, and then we would sit and share and share poems and stories or things in life. And it was just such an amazing thing. It was not too long after I had um, uh, found sobriety in my own life. And it was amazing that there was this happening where it was encouraged to come out and play and dance and not drug or drink. <laughs> right? But rather drink spe spirit, drink tea, you know, <laughs> like really charged beautiful spirit and to relay. It was also like um, encouraged not to do much speaking there, but rather to communicate through the dance and engaging with ideas like um, consent, 
right? Of how do we approach somebody that we want to dance with? Can we feel their energetic? You're welcome here. You, you know, not now, whatever it may be. How can we connect to not only the body language, but the heart language, the language of the will to understand more uh, without the necessity of words of where we are? You know, we're connecting um, more and more to our empathic gifts, I think many of us, which can be a challenging thing uh, especially when there's a bunch of drugs in the realm and whatever. So it was just such a great gift. And I came home that night and, and played my horn and wrote this ballad for the fishes. <laughs> and so it's amazing that it comes back to me now at this time with Venus applying to a perfect square to Neptune, Venus and Gemini, Neptune and Pisces. And I think a wonderful um, moniker, for this aspect of the day is dream dance. So are you dancing the dream and how in our own movements through this ocean of our reality, can we be playful in our dance, but also sensitive and appreciative of other, of other people's wishes and experiences. All right. So where to go? I could, I guess, share the, um, <laughs> the, the new protocol of how to go live on Facebook with a Zoom webinar. What a drag. I have a lot of other pages up here. One is a storytelling podcast episode that looks like I recorded 92315, which I will also post in the comments below. So for folks who are seeing this stream on one of these other pages like um, Astrology Hub Cafe or Cosmic Intelligence Agency, you can follow to the original video and find on my page. So some of these comments uh, or links that I'm mentioning for the comments, if you want to pursue that. But the um, podcast that I post here is um, one about um, Medusa and Pegasus and Perseus, one of my personal great heroes. And one of the reasons why um, that story is alive today um, is because Gary Caton, who will lead the Astrology Hub Inner Circle for the Taurus Lunation, we look at this new moon, is very close to the um, zodiacal projection of the fixed star Algol which is the eye of Medusa being held by Perseus. And that wonderful tale, I think that's as far as I'll go with that today, although it's a kind of a wonderful time to be there too, because this Taurus sun in solar opposition to a Scorpio Jupiter and that tale of Medusa, which is a tale of great pain and, and tragedy, but in the end, this, this beautiful, I think transmission of what it is. I mean, it, it's tricky when we engage with the myths. It's like, wow, okay, so for example, why did Athena turn Medusa's head into snakes? Because she was raped, as some say. You know, why punish the victim? And um, but as you'll hear in that podcast, if you choose to engage with it, you know, I, I see that time of Medusa, who was initially this beautiful queen of Libya, that that time of her engaged as the Gorgon with the snake hair and the looks that could literally kill. It was like the goo stage between caterpillar and butterfly, which would maybe be that essence of Medusa who was born through her blood finding its way to the stone of the temple where she was in hiding in her disgrace. And that blood itself became Pegasus who rises to the heavens. All right, so a tricky story. Another tricky story is a story of the Gemini twins. And um, this is where I wanted to go today to speak not about Castor and Polydeuces, kind of better known as Castor and Pollux, the Dioscuri, the sons of Zeus, the sons of God. 
um, who we often say are the Gemini twins. And we can look to the constellation known as Gemini, which I prefer to call the twins because constellation sign and signs are different things. But the two bright stars of the heads of that constellation are Castor and Pollux. Castor, who was the mortal twin, sets first as Castor died first and Pollux chose to release his immortality so he could live with his brother in the underworld. But in the end, Zeus creates this arrangement where together, eternally side by side, they will spend half their time in the visible places of the heavens and half their time in the underworld below. And it's a very beautiful tale, uh, one that I often speak um, in regards of Gemini mysteries. It's actually the first um, of the myths that brought me to the craft of storytelling that helped me see that um, these old tales live in our own mythos. And oftentimes our nativities, our birth charts will describe which of these great tales and not only those of Greece and Rome, but of all lands, how there's an archetypal webbing that we can all access and how some of these are more alive for us than they are for others. Now, the thing is, Castor and Pollux were actually two of quadruplets. There were two boys, Castor and Polydeuces, and two girls, Helen and Clytemnestra, who until this day I had pronounced Clytemnestra, but I had a consult earlier um, with a teacher who helped me know that the true pronunciation is Clytemnestra. And so hopefully I will clean that up. I also learned Asclepius rather than Asclepius for the great medicine man, the student of Chiron. Okay. So why today will I choose to go and um, play with these tales of the Gemini twins feminine? And these were Helen, who you may know as Helen of Troy and her sister Clytemnestra. Now, four of these children who were born by Leda and said to have hatched from swan's eggs. Um, let's say that two were the children of Zeus who turned himself into a swan to plant the seeds that would be born as Polydeuces, the immortal, and Helen. And that two were mortal children of Leda's husband, the king of Sparta, who is Tyndarius. And these two were Clytemnestra and Castor. So two boys, Castor and Polydeuces, two girls, Helen and Clytemnestra, and um, two immortals, Polydeuces and Helen into mortals, Clytemnestra and Castor. It's strange for me that I'm sharing this, but I'm feeling this pain now. I've had this left side thing for a long time in my own healing journeys. At one point, really trying to connect to why do I feel so divided? Like my right side, I, I know, and it's me and my left side. It's like something's in there that I have to exercise. And I came to this understanding, no, I don't have to push it away. I have to remember it and, and reclaim and reconnect these two sides. I mean, it's like an amazing Gemini trip, right? But I asked for the name of this pain. And what came in was Helen. And I had no idea what that would be about. And I mean, I had been doing some work around it's my left shoulder. Am I carrying the pain left side of the feminine and the way that uh, was alive in my own youth and other things? And how have I participated in that painful happening of patriarchy and whatnot? Um, but I realized in this meditation that this was Helen of Troy, who's really Helen of Sparta, her you know, the parents that she was raised by being Tyndarius king and later queen of that land before she was taken away. All right, I went live a while ago at the beach and spoke when Venus ingressed Gemini about Helen of Troy 
and about Paris. And I don't want to do too much of that today because I'd prefer to speak about Clytemnestra and some of her story, which I mentioned at that time. Um, I want to go back to a branch that I had interrupted at one point, which is to say that when we engage with these tales of old, there's a lot of pain there. Most of them do not have such happy endings, you know. But I feel personally when I help people connect to the mythos of their constellations even more than their signs. My clients will know that we spend sometimes more time in the astronomy software and looking at the alignments of this is where Venus was, this is the story of that star, and this is the tragic ending of that story. You are here to rewrite that. Yeah. Um, so I, I feel a lot of power in that encouragement of how can we align, the, realign these tales, but also why, why the pain, why the tragedy, you know, why would the gods and goddesses who I prefer to call the guides and guidesses bring this guidance in such painful way? Well, as we know, sometimes it's the die that helps us ask why, and it is that, um, calcination and burning in the earth gain that helps us engage with our purification and our healing and sometimes the medicine is only found once we realize that it wasn't he did that to me but he did that for me or even as we are all one let's speak neptune and pisces language i did that for me through the mask of this other right who is also me etc so the Helen story is fascinating. I mean, it was the beginning of the Trojan War, right? Which really started with the golden apple um, thrown by Eris, who was not invited to the marriage of Thetis and Belus. And uh, my apologies if my pronunciations are terrible. <laughs> I'm learning more and more about that. Um, but the apple was marked... Kalisti, for the fairest. And it said there was a great dispute, and it came down to these three who were Aphrodite, Venus, and Minerva, um, or Athena, and Hera, Juno, and that they decided that Zeus would be the one to decide which of the three was the most fair. And Zeus in a rare moment of wisdom, said, uh-uh. And so he found a mortal who had previously proven um, to be a good judge of character and other things in a stand-up being, and this was Paris. And um, Paris was chosen as a mortal to judge which of these three guidances was the most fair. And it is said they each offered a bribe and that he gave the golden apple to Aphrodite, who had bribed him by saying that he would be with the most beautiful woman on earth. And this happened to be Helen of Sparta, who I guess became Helen of Troy when he took her away. And in a very Gemini thing, was she taken or did she gladly go how did this look? Some say that Paris came to her kingdom. She was married to Menelaus and that he ate at Menelaus's table and made friends. And when Menelaus went off to travel, then Paris went away with Helen, who had been pierced by one of Cupid's arrows to fall for this being, for Cupid's mother Venus had arranged for this to go down in accordance with her promise that Paris would be with the most beautiful woman. Now, unfortunately, this beautiful woman was already married. Was she happily married, you know? Did she truly fall in love with Paris or did he just take her? Other authors suggest this. Regardless, the Trojan War was the result Helen is the one who could launch a thousand ships, it said. And now we get into some more challenging pain of this story. That there was no wind because I believe it was um, Hera who, because the apple was not given to her, <laughs> was 
all about um, throwing a monkey wrench in this whole situation. No, you know what? I'm I'm misspeaking. I have no idea, so I should not go there. But read the tale of the Trojan War as I will uh, to kind of patch up my understanding of the thing. Regardless, a wind was not to be had. And it was decided by those who had now gathered these ships to go to war to bring Helen back to her husband, Menelaus. Um, that for a win, they must sacrifice to Artemis, a virgin. And this was a very difficult thing because Helen's sister, Clytemnestra, was married to the brother of Helen's husband. Helen's husband, Menelaus, king of Sparta, his brother was Agamemnon. And it is said that the marriage of Agamemnon and Clytemnestra was not happy in any way, and that her one true saving grace was her daughter, Iphigenia. Agamemnon tricked his wife and said, dress her in her wedding whites, for I have found a fit prince for her to wed. But truly, he just wished her to be dressed for the sacrificial altar. Now, some say that Artemis herself substituted in the last moment when the knife began to fall um, a stag in her place and that Iphigenia ever since has served as a principal priestess of the temple's Artemis. Who's to say? And the greater question is, what does this mean? What is this in me, right? How is this participating in my own share of this thing that I've been told is named Helen? How in my own life have I participated as all of the characters of this tale? And how can I rewrite it? So they go to war and it lasted a lot longer <laughs> than they planned for it too, as you may know. And... Um, many, many deaths, and the Trojan horse, and the, the wisdom of Odysseus, and all sorts of things. Um, let's not go too far there, but I will say this. Well, one thing is that Odysseus kind of cursed Neptune after the war, and then he was set to the Odyssey of 10 years of not being able to find his way home and being lost at sea. Interestingly, with 12 ships led by 12 people who follow him, so think about these different things like 12 tribes and 12 apostles and 12 signs around a principal light, and we could go on and on there. But what I will say here is that um, Agamemnon, Clytemnestra's husband, the king, took another um, bride or love overseas, and this was Cassandra. Now, Cassandra was a great prophetess. She had earned this gift from Apollo. She had also earned a curse. So we have to rewind again and say that Apollo himself, in a way, was cursed by two arrows from Cupid's bow, one that ensured he would love desperately because the other ensured his love would never be returned. So there are amazing stories like Apollo trying to convince Daphne that he was the man for her as she ran away and prayed and became a tree and he's reaching around this bark, you know, as he finally catches up, but their love would not be. Tales after tales after tales of the shining light of the sun, Helios, Apollo, who was truth and beauty and music, right? But cursed to not know love. And one of these examples was of Cassandra, for Apollo chose to court her. And she said, you know, I'd really love that, to learn that divination thing you do. And he just wanted to hang out. So he's like, yeah, here, this is how it works. And she became this great prophetess. But then he realized that she was not interested in being with him the way that he had dreamed. And so then he cursed her. He couldn't take this gift of prophecy away, but he cursed her in such a way that none would believe these prophecies that she spoke. 
One of those, in fact, was upon the return of Agamemnon. Cassandra said, our blood will run in the fountains of your palace. And he wouldn't listen. She was cursed to not be believed. And this indeed was true. Clytemnestra herself had found new love. And she and this love plotted to murder Agamemnon upon his return. And Cassandra fell prey to the same blade. Now, Clytemnestra's daughter and son, the daughter being Electra, and the son being Orestes, who actually loved their mother, Clytemnestra, much more than father. But as it is in the code, let's maybe think Saturn and Capricorn here, if mother kills father, you must kill mother, right? Which is a strange trip and not something I suggest you live by. Um, but that's how it went. And so they plotted their mother's death. This tragedy of, of Clytemnestra, whose one love, Iphigenia, was taken away for the sacrifice to gain wins for war over her sister, who either was taken herself or perhaps gladly went, who is to know what even so was it the manipulation from arrows of Cupid's bow? And what is this golden apple, Callisti, for the fairest that began this whole thing? Now it triggers and challenges, but I will say that the tale of the Trojan War was actually the awakening of a beautiful feminine strength that you know, in the Greeks who seem to have so much reverence in those days for the goddess, it certainly did not seem that was also held for the woman. And we find at the beginning these three great goddesses arguing over which of them is the most fair. And the discord heiress who threw the apple in the first place, right? I mean, great powers behaving like human beings. <laughs> um, and in the end, there's these tragedies, but also these stories of empowerment and faith. And I mean, one wonderful tale is that of Penelope, who kept the faith of her love for Odysseus, despite the time of him being away for, I think, 20 years. Um, and keeping the suitors at bay through the internal weave and I'll let you go play in that tale if you choose. Sirens and temptresses and all these ways that these Homer stories feel to just perpetuate patriarchal positioning also carry in them this medicine of the results of such conditioning and abuse. Let's go to the charts <laughs> before I fall in tears. Um, let me say one more thing about Electra. One of the stars of the Pleiades is known as, the, as Electra as well, as there is an asteroid called Electra. And they're kind of different beings. The Pleiadian star, Electra. Let me see if I can share a few things here. The asteroid Electra is typically associated with Clytemnestra's daughter, who I spoke of before, who plotted the murder of her mother, who had murdered her father. Yikes, right? So here's a Wikipedia on Electra with the and then here's another Electra, this one coming from the wonderful website constellationsofwords.com. Um, you know, let me pause this share and I'll post both of these links also in the comments of this stream. So there's the one from constellationsofwords.com. 
wikipedia.com and then this wikipedia article about Clytemnestra's daughter Electra. Okay, we resume share. Here's a tale. And internet connection is unstable for the third time, by the way. Hopefully this video is streaming okay. Um, anyway, here's a tale from constellationsofwords.com about the Pleiadian star Electra, one of the seven sisters, um, clearly visible to the naked eye, yet Electra is the missing Pleiad. There is also another Merope who is considered the lost Pleiade. Um, and so you can look into these seven stars like Alcyon and Amaya, um, the wonderful stories. But to read here, um, Zeus fathered the, the son of Electra, Dardanus, who founded Troy. See these connections? The star is clearly visible to the new eye, yet Electra is the missing Pleiad who withdrew her light in sorrow at the destruction of Lilium, the house of Dardanus. Electra, they say, left her sisters and took a place in the Arctic Circle. That is why they sing in Troy's last hour, Electra shrouded her form in mist and cloud in the last Pleiad band. Still rises up their bright troop in the skies, but she alone hides viewless ever since the town of her son Dardanus in ruin fell. Electra had another son, Jason, and a third, but more frequently this third child is known as Harmonia. And so we go on and on and on. This stream is endless. You know, is there anything in here for us that we can see in a chart, right? So we will now move to part two of this stream, which is to get into the charts and astrology. And I know for many of you friends, this is just Greek, right? I mean, what are these symbols and these lines and all these wild things? Is it easier like that? Can I take some of these beings away and make it more simple to see? Maybe I will simplify things and show just the three that I mentioned of Sun applying to the Jupiter opposition of Mercury, who's close to Eris, Discord, in that golden apple, squaring Pluto, and Venus, who is applying to perfect her square from Gemini to Neptune in Pisces, like just about in this moment, I'll tell you when that perfects. It might be right now. Let's see, I've got Virgo on the rise, May 7th, 2018, 157, 22 p.m. where I sit at home in Seattle, Washington and getting very close. I actually probably have to trick my software by going back a few days so that it doesn't skip to the next Venus Neptune square. But where I am in Seattle, this will happen as Venus is culminating and Neptune is setting at 257.55 here, coming very soon to a theater called you in about one hour's time. So wherever you are, you know, if you're where I am, Virgo will be in the rise when this goes down. Oh, see that skip to the next one. Um, with Gemini at the midheaven and these two signs so associated with Mercury. And so we can just engage with all of these beings in this geometry be before we bring in Mars and Capricorn and Saturn there as well. And Uranus in the last degrees of Aries just before the ingress of May 15th to the sign of Taurus. Moons in Aquarius today and this trine with Venus and the nodes as they have been since May of 2017, North and Leo, South and Aquarius, the nodes of the moon. So moon has just crossed her South node into Southern latitude and is very close to the ecliptic plane. And she is square as we see today, sun. What does that mean? We are in the third quarter phase with a T square, the Jupiter, of a seed that was planted in Aries on April 15th, our last new moon with Uranus. The next one will be Taurus at Algol, opposite Jupiter, Uranus at the very first minutes of 
Taurus and yada, yada, yada. And so wheels within wheels within wheels, tricky to get a clean experiment. And, you know, astrology is so overwhelming and there's so many ways to pet the cosmic cat, we can very easily get lost. And so oftentimes when I sit with clients and we drink the astralo tea to honor the most important planets, the one that chose you and me and we call her Earth, I will often express and engage through the starry tales because they speak to us on a deep level. And I've studied the starry stories of many lands and tribes, and yet something in my blood really connects to these Greek myths. Is it because it's also at the root of um, much of the astrological archetypes or something about my own heritage? I have no idea, but um, they're the ones that I typically voice and maybe best understand that I can't understand all right, so I want to bring in a bunch of beings here today. Let's start by just looking at Venus and Neptune. Now, there's like 100,000 plus asteroids, most of them between Mars and Jupiter, where I would suggest a great planet once was. I'm certainly not the first to. Um, and that these remnants of that planet that somehow broke apart are these asteroids of that particular belt. It's not the only place where we look to beings outside of the planetary ones. For example, Chiron is a centaur who typically exists between the orbits of Saturn and Uranus. Um, and some of the asteroids are in different places besides this principal belt between Mars and Jupiter. And there's so many that it's like, you know, if you put them all in, the, just the whole wheel would be complete. And I don't go to them too often, but sometimes I'm very interested. For example, today with Venus in Gemini, and I'm thinking about the Helen and Clytemnestra twins of this great tale, um, I can bring in Clytemnestra and see her here in Libra opposite Chiron. I can bring in um, Iphigenia and see her in Pisces. I can bring in Agamemnon and see here in Aquarius some interesting links. I can bring in Helena, who's named for Helen of Troy, and see her right with Mercury today near Eris. I can bring in Helenos, which was actually originally a mistake <laughs> because I was trying to get Helena. But Helenos was a son of Priam, a brother to Paris. And it's interesting to look at the Helenos, Neptune, Venus, T square, especially because Electra opposite. And so a lot of these characters who have been introduced in our storytelling portion, part one of the stream, come alive in this alignment of Venus and Neptune today, of Mercury and Pluto, Eris today. And we can bring in the other beings and this thing gets cluttered pretty dang quickly, right? So we will also take all of these asteroids away. But I wanted to show that. I also wanted to show that the uh, geocentric north node of Venus is right at the Pleiades, where one of the stars, perhaps the one we can't see because of the seven sisters, usually the good eye test sees six, though you can see up to nine with good dark skies and good eyes. Um, that Electra is often said to be the one that split. All right, so now tons of things here. <laughs> and I just wanted to utilize this astrological happening to explore many of these asteroids to say, yeah, all sorts of characters of this tragedy of old are really resonant and alive. I could speak to what each one of them means 
but I would actually prefer to extend an invitation. I brought them in one at a time to show you some of their specific alignments to look at that. But, you know, this like Venus, um, Neptune, Electra becomes very interesting. I'm not sure if I want to bring in Paris's brother, Helenos, to complete the mutable grand square or grand cross but this fascinates me and it's something that i'll be exploring in my meditations today it's very strong if i go from an hour to to an hour from now when venus perfects the neptune square i'll see an incredibly strong t square here part tile we say these days of planets in the same degrees of different signs in alignment and it's interesting, too, that where I am in Seattle, this whole thing goes down. I think we saw 255 about was the exact alignment of Venus and Neptune with Neptune setting Venus culminating and Electra down below at the IC. Again, that's my local space. So by signs and degrees and alignments, this happens for all of us. The signs are the whole. They resonate actually in the center of Earth. The houses are the particular, right? Just like wherever you may be, let's say Canberra, Australia, it's a different culture than here in Seattle or over in Jerusalem or whatever. The houses are going to look different in the same moment of the exact Venus-Neptune square. And I want to honor... Sun, Jupiter, to say, let's go deep into this thing and find where the magic is, you know. I want to honor Mercury, Pluto, and say, let's kind of square off in a unique, new, fiery expression of our consciousness with the power struggles and these kinds of things, but also more importantly, the powerful return of the true wisdom and voice of the earth. May that be what Capricorn um, in her true essence shows herself to us to be if we choose to connect to the other ways. And we'll bring in a bunch of beings once again. I could say, where's Juno and Vesta interestingly square today as well. Aries, Juno, Square, Capricorn, Vesta, Ceres, who's been traveling with the North Node for some time, and Leo, Pallas, Athena, very interestingly, also in Gemini at the time. And we can just add points forever again until the wheel is entirely full. How much does that serve us? Because sometimes what we'll do in our healing, like I can just say, all right, Venus is square and Neptune. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> what does it mean? Well, it means Electra and Iphigenia and Helenos. <laughs> and, you know, it's like, no, it doesn't, dude. Take it easy. Like, what are you running away from as you're running towards all these other pieces? Bring it back to the root of the thing. Bring it back to the visibility. We'll honor this. What is the one being of all of these that we can see? And the answer is Venus. But how do these other experiences and conversations and connections to beings visible and invisible inform this? What about the Aquarius moon at this time of the trine or the square between Venus and Neptune? What about a, the Aquarius moon applying very strongly to trine Venus? Do we see some ally here? But how is that happening in the square to the sun and Jupiter and wheels within wheels and yada, yada, yada. All right. So I'm going to take us to part three here and just speak a little bit first about um, what it is when we have a gazillion transits at once and how as astrologers and Anybody who's still on this trip at this time, that's what you are. I don't care if this is your work in the world, if you're giving private astrological counsel professionally or whatever. If you're following the planets, you are an astrologer. Put your hand on your heart and yell it to the skies. <laughs> I am remembering the old ways and my culture thinks I'm a freak. <laughs> yeah. 
and thank you for this because the planets miss us. It used to be one of the great gifts of humanity to respect these lights of the guidances and guides reverently. And these days we do it mostly on softwares and screens instead of the big screen of the actual heavens. So just going today, tonight, after sunset, tomorrow, to connect visibly to the bright and beautiful evening star light that is this high shining Gemini Venus. And to ask her, you know, what is this about? Like I'll go down in Seattle to the Puget Sound where there's the uh, Olympic mountains on the Western horizon, which I call Mount Olympus because that's where the guides and guidesses set. And I like to see them going home to their Olympian, Olympian palace. Um, but, you know, I'll have this opportunity out there to engage with the light of Venus over this water. And I imagine I'll see her reflected there and then to kind of go into the water to find Neptune and to feel her square. And I will also do this with my body and make a square and give one arm to Venus and point my other down through the ground to connect also to Neptune. I'll probably here in an hour as Venus is culminating in my local south with Neptune on the horizon, do the same thing. I have a hand for Venus and a hand for Neptune and I can feel that square in my body. So I have Venus and Neptune square in my natal chart and interestingly Neptune on the descendant in my natal chart. So for Venus and Neptune to be squaring where I am, sharing this story and connecting to theirs with Neptune on the horizon, receiving the square from Venus, it's like really home for me. And so it's actually not that rare for me. Many say we shouldn't share our own charts for magical reasons and such. Um, Everyone can have their own philosophy. Many say, you know, we should just explore the charts of famous people and whatever, and that's okay, but I don't know them and I can't know you really. Can I even know myself? That's the game of astrology as far as I'm concerned. May this starry science confirm what I know and open new windows of contemplation and practice and play for me to experience why I'm here and how I can share. Now in my own nativity, I'll just show it to you here, right? The last warning would be, is it just some ego move to share my chart rather than another example? You be the judge. Leo's on the rise when I began the share. <laughs> Um, and that's where the IC and Saturn live in my own nativity. Um, but here you see Neptune, who is very strongly configured to the descendant of my birth. Unlike this moment um, of the exact square that we saw on the chart before, it was not Venus above in the square to Neptune of the descendant, but rather Venus below. And it's an important thing because a technique that I want to share with you, I first learned um, through... Robert Blaschke uh, was a wonderful astrologer who sadly passed some time ago um, about phase returns and working on those as very principal times within the windows of our transits. Okay, so Venus, Virgo, square, Sagittarius, Neptune is like Venus, Gemini, square, Pisces, Neptune, right? So if Venus was here in Gemini, Pisces, Neptune there, and it's not, right? And it gets us into some of the old language, tricky words for it, but maybe good for us to bring in today that the faster moving planet, first of all, is the one that casts the ray. So this is not a Neptune, Venus square in my nativity. This is a Venus Neptune square. By the way, it's also separating. It's been there, done that. Venus squared Neptune before I was born on October 24th. The square was perfect on October 18th. And I treat that 
very literally i treat that to not that it's not part of me but it's in my inheritance my lineage whether that's traits of the ancestors or genetic predisposition or culmination of past life i can't really say but it's part of the soul's coding from before where the applying aspect um let's say i'm looking at a week before here i'll go a couple weeks this is also venus square neptune but she's applying to that which means it's about to happen and we can utilize predictive techniques or i prefer productive techniques like secondary progressions to see in that case well when would that happen this aspect here unless venus retrogrades which didn't happen and maybe even if so it did not testify as the ancients would say but to the ancients that being wasn't around anyway <laughs> okay so there's two types of squares you know we can ask like moon and sun today here we are at the third quarter moon right now yeah so moon is as the planets travel this way through the zodiac the moon is looking back in her diurnal travel the earth is the middle of the chart spinning west to east so we notice the heavens rising the east setting in the west the planets move in our sky from the east to the west and so this looking back which happens in the second half of a synodic cycle like moon and sun when the faster moving planet has to look back that was called the sinister square which is tricky language um especially because sinister actually means left-handed so this is here's the moon it's a left-handed aspect the opening square of this particular lunation in the sign of leo which was right up my saturn and square my uranus as long as my charts up here um is the dexter square Okay, moon's gonna follow the sun this way and she's looking ahead to the sun. It's a right-handed Dexter aspect. So even thinking about, you know, in our modern time, what sinister means, is this a demonization of the left-handed side? Is that also, as it is in many traditional speak, the feminine side, what does that mean, right? So we wanna be careful with how we are, um, phrasing this very potential lockdown patriarchal language but we also want to make sure we don't throw away the technique if we realign the way that we speak because if i say sinister means evil i want to get rid of that but if i say sinister means left-handed well it describes a lot right so like i'll look at my nativity here's moon applying to a trine to the sun and can you tell if that's sinister or dexter is it left-handed or right-handed? And the answer is, if you just think about them going this way, moon has to look back to the sun. And that's the sinister aspect in the lunation or any cycle of a faster moving planet and a slower moving planet, the faster moving planet in the opening half of the cycle from the conjunction to the opposition is in the dexter period. And then the second half of the cycle from the opposition to the next conjunction is the sinister period. The ancients gave much more attention to applying aspects than they did separating aspects and much more attention also to dexter or right-handed aspects than they did to sinister or left-handed aspects. Like a moon waxing and building energy is more of a energetic happening perhaps than her waning away from her fullness i'm lacking the language to describe this but engaging with the old language is very interesting to do in that regard it's part of my pursuit okay so all that being said we know my personal venus is separating from the perfect square to neptune right a square is 90 degrees this venus neptune angle 90 would be 1504 from venus right so it's that minus almost perfectly five degrees it's 85 degrees is this angle and who moves faster venus or neptune venus right i mean i could go back and i'm always interested in this well when did their dance begin the dance of venus and neptune that i was born 
to participate within their conjunction well before my conception, almost a year before my birth on November 26, 1974, was interestingly right near the star Antares that is my setting star. My setting star was not a thing for another almost year from then, 11 months. And yet this was in a sense, the conception of the relationship of Venus and Neptune that I was born to explore and for me to do so more personally, I can say, well, it's a fourth house Venus. And even if I want to go whole sign, fourth sign Venus. Separating from the third quarter square with Neptune in Sagittarius. I'll go back to, I look at the new moon or a conjunction in a synodic cycle, like with any planet like Venus and Neptune as the seed. I look to the opening square, which would be what? The Dexter square, you see Venus follows Neptune this way and is a looking ahead, throwing her ray to the right as the sprout. I look at the opposition as the flower and I look at, that's interesting, one, one, two, three, Hadn't seen that one before. And I look to the closing square, which is like a waning half moon of the cycle as the fruit. Wisdom, it carries the seeds to be planted in the soil the next cycle. Now that doesn't mean it's necessarily wise. Let's think about what, I mean, even this alone <laughs> might mean on the nativity. Neptune at the descendant disillusion, confusion, delusions in relationship, right? I mean, is that emphasized by a square to Venus? And we might even want to go traditional and say Venus in her fall in Virgo. Sure. Has that played out in my life? No. Yes. <laughs> okay. But becoming conscious of this allows me to say, what can it mean in its beauty? The dream dance. What is the dream of true higher relating? And not just to intimate partners, but in relating. How can I keep the faith and the hope that every being that I contact is a beautiful being? Well, for me to do that, I have to learn to become one. And this is one of the impetus. A square brings conflict for resolution. It activates, right? It's an active force. But the closing square, Rudyar called the conflict in spirit. That's what I think of as the fruit. Where the opening square, the Dexter square, he called the conflict in action. That's what I think of as the sprout. And that's an interesting contemplation. So I'm in no ways trying to say that because Venus is past the fruit stage at the time of my birth, I'm fully wise in the ways of the Venus-Neptune relation. But rather to, well, maybe I'll even say, it could take longer, right? I'm born towards the end of the cycle. I'm interesting, interested for my own experience here to see when their next conjunction and where was after my birth. And the answer is January 11th, 76. And this is just for my own personal growth. Okay. So this alignment at the time of my birth with Venus separating from uh, a sinister square with Neptune, she's casting her ray to the left. She has to look back, you see. It is like, but also unlike this moment now where we have the Gemini Venus squaring Neptune in Pisces, yeah? Gemini Venus, as they move this way in the diurnal motion, is looking forward. This is the Dexter square of a cycle that began when Venus met Neptune in Pisces in some very interesting um, arrangements at the time. Wait, what was going on? There he is. Anyway. Um, so here we are today. She, since that time, uh, you know, it would maybe be more 
universal to put a zero Aries whole sign chart, a so-called natural chart wheel here, but we'll just use my chart as this basis to watch I'm bringing Mars into the mix for some reason, but that's okay. Venus waxing away from Neptune, separating from Neptune on the Dexter side. And then the, the sprout of that Pisces seed happens today with Venus and Gemini, you see. Well, while this is like my natal square, it's also the exact opposite of it. And you may notice astrologers with Neptune here and my Venus here, that this means something maybe special for me because I am in the transit known as Neptune opposite Venus. I've cleared my Neptune square Neptune which is the so-called second midlife crisis transit. We need to be careful with these words. And here's the date of the exact last square of Neptune squaring my personal Neptune, January 14, 2017. Well, look where Venus was. Interesting. And the first opposition of Neptune by transit to my natal Venus happened pretty recently on April 4th. And I can just look at when, when are the next exacts? There'll be another one on September 8th. And Venus at that time is actually aligned pretty close to my sun and at my secondary progressed Venus with the sun right at my natal Venus and wheels within wheels within wheels. We can go on and on. We'll do some of that today. Neptune in retrograde at that time, direct once again, February 4th, 2019. And then Neptune will retrograde and come back not to make another exact opposition with Neptune, you either get five exact awakenings or three. But I like to, as I was initially trained to do so in the shamanic astrology mystery school, a lot around the same amount of time for each being, whether you're in a three or a five um, exact alignment situation. And so I will feel that my Neptune opposite Venus transit is alive until this late November 2019 time. It's interesting to see that November 27th, because if you'll remember the Venus-Neptune conjunction before my birth in the sign of Sagittarius was November 26th, 1974. Learn something new every show. Check out where Venus is at this time in relation to my own personal Mars. And Mars at my sun and Uranus, opposite Uranus and square Saturn and wheels within wheels within wheels. So sometimes it's just too much. So before I go into the too much of the thing, let me share with you this idea of phase return astrology, because often what we'll do in times of transits is we'll just say, okay, here I am, Neptune is less than a degree opposite my Venus. The exact alignment, the first of three, was April 4th, 2018. And some will say, well, that's when it's happening. You might want to look at one or two degrees orb before, you know, sometime around February um, or March. When Neptune comes in, I mean, it's pretty interesting that the Venus-Neptune um, conjunction was within a degree and a half about orb opposite my natal Venus, right? That brings more attention to this cycle. And many will say, okay, and, you know, it leaves orb after Neptune separates by maybe one degree, maybe two. So here's Neptune separating by one degree. It's kind of like now, right? 1504 natal Venus. And so when Neptune clears 1604 Pisces, it's like the transit loosens up for a time. There are strong energies when the alignment's like more perfect and then it loosens up. Neptune will not leave the opposition to my personal Venus by more than two degrees because she retrogrades on June 18th, 2018. Interesting very close to my person Saturn and squaring my son Uranus and wheels within wheels within wheels. But Neptune's going to come back. And so, you know, does the orb of one degree, which will happen around here, 
very interestingly, because why do I stop? Well, Neptune opposite Venus for all of us is July 24th, 2018. And clearly you can see this is a time of a Venus return for me. And I want to do this for my own personal learning. Wonderful. Right around the time of a total blood moon, <laughs> solar lunar eclipse with Mars. Well, Chiron is squaring my little Mars and Uranus is opposite my sun and on and on and on and wheels within wheels within wheels. And so we take a lot of these beings away and we get back to the Venus Neptune conversation. A few ways I can look at this. You know, if I just printed out lists of my transits, I would then retrieve September 8th with Neptune exact opposite my Venus. And then that third one, as we saw earlier, I would see February 4th, 2019. It's going to print out those things. Sometimes you'll see this range of when the energy is alive and then most activated. Another way I can do is to play while I'm in a time of Neptune opposite Venus by transit, I can play with what Neptune and Venus are doing together um, in the sky. And so I can look at this February 21st, 2018 time as a seed. And I can say the sprout then would be when um, Venus squares Neptune. I'm going to make sure. Even here, I'm performing correct nomenclature. Faster moving planet first, y'all, because she's the one that's going to apply and separate from these alignments. And so that's today. <laughs> Venus opposite Neptune, which we saw a moment ago. Oops, wrong button. And that will be July 24th, pretty close to my natal Venus, you know, within about a degree orb. And then Venus square Neptune, the closing square of their synodic cycle, or the sinister square, January 20th, 2019. Now, <laughs> I mean, let me continue. I'll go to their next seed, and that is April 9th, 2019. I'll say I'm very much still alive in my Neptune opposite Venus initiation or invitation during that period of time though you can see it coming well out of ore but here's the sprout of that cycle here's the fruit of that cycle here is the sorry that's the flower as i like to say of the cycle the full moon is a flower and here's the fruit and we see at this last square of Venus squaring Neptune, a pretty strong alignment within one degree orb of my natal Venus. Yeah, Neptune's then going to go direct very shortly thereafter. Interestingly, November 27th, I think we saw that date. Um, but this last fruit, as I like to say, or so called sinister square of the cycle, November 14th, 2019. Now, twice within this happening, I will have a phase return, okay? So I go to today, ensure Venus and Neptune are square, 90 degrees. But in my personal nativity, they are not. In my personal nativity, they're about 85 degrees. And so last week, and I celebrated this, um, Venus came in actually right at my ascendant to create this... Um, 85 degree opening square or dexter square or sprout of the venus neptune seed um, sometime around here yeah i mean right at my ascendant okay <laughs> and wheels within wheels within wheels i could tell tales of december and stories of helen and yada 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 and i won't um but notice that this is not my phase return, yeah? Because the phase for me, where I was born of Venus-Neptune, it was not the Dexter square. I think I mistakenly called this one the sinister, whatever, the opening square. I was born separating from the closing square, right? So when's that going to happen? I can look to the next 
Venus Neptune square, which will happen in January 2019. And then I can say, not only is she square, but my Venus is separating from that square by five degrees, right? Somewhere in the stone. Or very conveniently, in Intrepid software, I can go to phase angle returns and choose um, Venus and Neptune and find exactly that it's January 25th, 2019. I can also see that the one the following year is, well, so June 20th, 2019 that we see here that was just printed out. This is like a phase return, but it's actually the opposite side of the thing. This is the opening square or about applying to an opening square where mine is separating from a closing square. So I can look at this date as well of uh, January 25th, 2019. And Blaski's idea, and I love it, was that it is these phase returns. Let me actually go to my first. That it's these um, phase returns where within the time period of our transits in a Neptune, because Neptune moves so slowly, a Neptune transits a long time like 18, 20 months, really. But it's, a, it's these phase returns where it is most active, activated, regardless of orb. Now, I happen to be with Neptune opposite my Venus in very strong orb at this time, right? But I could say, all right, well, if I'm looking for these so-called exact hits, which I really do not, as I said before, enjoy that word. It just brings us into fear astrology invitations right there was neptune opposite my venus um, it's coming after this time the third exact alignment on february 4th 2019 but that it's actually the phase return the original recipe or relationship by phase angle of the two beings in considering this transit that's the time where it's going to be most charged and alive for me, right? So January 25th, 2019, I shall disappear. <laughs> I have no idea, right? We want to therefore also be careful. Here's this date. What do I do about it? Is Neptune going to lift me to the heavens and drop me into the underworld or well, you know, be careful, right? So don't even play if that's where you go. Take a walk. It's much, it's much better for you. But how can we do this in such a way that it will bring, you know, invitation to harness the powers of the many notes, the planets of our soul song, our birth chart. And I want to look at that chart, you know, and even if I'm in Seattle, you know, Pluto's culminating at that time with Taurus rising, et cetera. And wow, well, Venus is with Jupiter the moon's on my Pluto, Mercury, and yeah, you know, look to all of these different symbols, Mars at Jupiter, while Venus is with Jupiter. Okay, wheels within wheels within wheels. So there's a thing about phase angles. Here's the things about the ingredients of the soul stew that you are cooking for you at this time, and I'll just speak about me because my chart's up here. All right, so today we've got this Mercury square Pluto thing calling attention to the truth that I'm in a Pluto square Jupiter transit. I could look at this angle between Jupiter, natal Jupiter and natal Pluto, figure out their phase angle, see when that's activated within the time of um, a Jupiter, a, a Pluto square Jupiter transit. And I probably, you know, actually let's do that. So here we go. Here's another example. We'll do the phase return thing still. Pluto is squaring my natal Jupiter. The first exact square from Pluto to my natal Jupiter was December 12th, 2017. And there will be more, right? So here is, actually, sorry. That was the last exact square. There were a few before them. 
July 9th, 2017, yada, yada, yada. I'll just say like when I look now, Pluto is going to go direct at 1845 Capricorn. For me, that energy is pretty much still alive. But in this time of Pluto squaring my Jupiter, this phase angle could not repeat because Jupiter and my nativity is quincunx about, right? Pluto, I can look into the harmonic astrology as I am more and more and go in that well, but, but there's no way that that phase angle is gonna replete because Pluto and moves very slowly and Jupiter about a sign a year, okay? So I can't really play that phase angle game here. I might look more to the exact invitations or awakenings, all right. So back to today, and I'll just show you some things we know now that I'm personally going through Neptune opposite Venus. And I'll say that's very activated today because of the square between those two planets. And one of the ways I can serve that is actually sharing some of what I do. A more important way is to get out there, witness Venus, and to do my own work, <laughs> my own play. Chiron has ingressed Aries and is squaring my natal Mars. And I can look then to how I was born with Mars um, in a strange arrangement that I might figure out the vibrational or harmonic um, essence of, but I can also just look to the phase Oh, no, I can't. I can't do a phase angle return for Chiron in this particular software, but I could sort that out, right? Anyway, the point of this story is that while Neptune is opposing my Venus, I'm also experiencing the invitation of transiting Chiron, squaring my natal Mars, who in many ways is still in his receiving of Saturn's opposition by transit. And Saturn is also squaring my natal Mercury and Pluto and Uranus coming soon to a theater called Us Ingresses Taurus and doing so Uranus will oppose my natal sun and my natal Uranus and square my natal Saturn. But very interestingly, Uranus is going to station retrograde in August, right at my Saturn degree, but before applying to the opposition for my Uranus to the so-called third um, midlife crisis transit, Pluto square Pluto, Neptune square Neptune, Uranus opposite Uranus. That it, it, It's cool to look at things generationally like that, but it's also not enough. I mean, it's interesting just to look at this chart and I love this program. You can see how quickly I can click around like this. And so they're just printing out a list of these dates. Even when you do cast a chart for that date, see when the moment happens, because if you don't, you'll miss things like as you're in a stations on the square to my Saturn, I'm in a lunar return as it happens every month. But interesting, Mars is opposite my natal Saturn. There's a square of Mars and Uranus activating that transit of Uranus opposite Sun, Uranus square, Saturn, which might begin then. Chiron is square, my natal Mars. Neptune opposite my natal Venus. Jupiter transiting my north node, which is very strong today and, and especially has been these last few weeks and whatnot. And that great teaching there has been to go to Jupiter in the sky so he can show me where my north node lives in the heavens. And I know now where I can direct my focus, my visible attention, my sentient experience and my prayer to align myself to the wishes of my north lunar node in the sign of Scorpio, you see. So let me stop this share, at least the screen and not this share, because I'll babble about this a little bit. <clears throat> Saturn opposite Mars, Saturn square Mercury, Saturn square Pluto, Pluto square Jupiter, Neptune opposite Venus, Chiron square Mars, Neptune, Uranus opposite Sun, Uranus square Saturn. Ah, and <laughs> you could just explode. I want to show you something. I'll be right back.
In February of 2013, shortly after I found astrology, I went down to Arizona and took a um, transits and lifetime class with Shamanic Astrology Mystery School with Daniel Jamario and Kaylin Castell. And one of the processes after we learned how to kind of compute the timing of transits was to uh, construct a vision board regarding our transits at the time. <laughs> So I went down there having been told that I was in Pluto square Pluto, which looks like this for me, and Saturn square Saturn, which looked like this for me at the time. You know, hold them on your shoulders, and if you fall, then everyone gets eaten by the shark. But I didn't even know when I put this on there that the shark has a little antenna. He's remote controlled, so that says a lot. You know, I've got this dude running into the 2012 <laughs> flag of the matador and there's this this jupiter at my ascendant but this was the nodal return and the cosmic reunion and you know so i went down there having heard that i'm in pluto square pluto and saturn square saturn it's around 37 years old and a nodal return that happens for all of us i hadn't been told that there was a total solar eclipse partile my north node <laughs> i hadn't been told this and so I'm kind of a nerdy, quick student. And at the time that um, the teachings were happening, I was doing all these calculations and realizing that I was at that time, not only in Pluto square Pluto, but Pluto square Mercury and Chiron square, the ascendant and Jupiter can join the ascendant and Jupiter conjunct the moon and Saturn conjunct the sun and Saturn squaring Saturn and the nodal return and Saturn squaring the midheaven and Jupiter conjunct Mars coming soon and Jupiter squaring Venus after that. I mean, so much stuff. Ah, and it's really tricky. You know, sometimes in astrology in consult, the greatest thing you can do it's kind of just look at the, the one thing that you want to talk about. The better thing you can do is speak with somebody and you can hear what's alive for them. And then maybe that points you to the one thing you want to rap about. I like to, in true Gemini fashion, bring this storm of, oh, there's these gazillion things happening for you right now. Am I going to explode? No. <laughs> But honor them each as a specific ingredient of the soul stew that you are cooking for you. By the way, I like to look at the house, and I use porphyry houses for this methodology at least, of the secondary progressed moon as the mood of the soul and the bowl that's holding the stew. I like to say that the perfected time lord, if you're into that trip, Hellenistically speaking, is whose kitchen you're cooking in but that these transits, they're all different ingredients. Now, when we cook, we want to honor every ingredient that we're working with. But the point of the thing is, what are you cooking? And that progressed moon is the bowl. What are you serving it in? Because we tea folk know that the cup is as important as the leaf. Hmm. This is a very important cup to me. All right. So what is this ingredient called Neptune opposite Venus? What is this ingredient called Chiron square Mars? What is this ingredient called Saturn opposite Mars and Saturn square Mercury and Saturn square Pluto and Pluto square Jupiter and Uranus opposite the sun. And it was like a lot going on in this recipe, yo. And sometimes that's how it is. And you will find this is especially true for astrologers. We tend to arrange times where everything loves at once. And notice I did not use the word hit. It's dang confusing. It's confusing to have one transit perhaps especially when Neptune is involved. But to look at that long-standing transit of Neptune opposite my Venus, there was this long transit, Pluto square, Jupiter, and now it's kind of Neptune's like taking that transit baton and says, here's this large container. I could say this is also true, progressed moon, secondary progressed moon in the ninth house for me. Larger, longer containers where these quicker things like Saturn square Mercury, a nine month happening where Chiron square Mars longer, 
or Uranus opposite the sun in about a year. All these things are happening in these containers. And so looking at like the map of it's this, which leads to that, and this comes alive before it's over, but that ends to help this one bring its energy and translate it into this other thing. And right, so to see how it's like developing and there's this story, it's like, these myths that we began with, there's so many different bits and you can follow them forever. I mean, where did, as Chiron is squaring my natal Mars now, where were Mars and Chiron conjoined before my birth? What is that seed that I'm participating with synodically? And obviously, I mean, you can look at one transit chart like this, especially in times like where I am right now, so blowing my mind, so much different stuff happening and I mean, I could just be here until I'm like withered and old trying to figure it out. But for me, it's to ceremoniously honor Chiron is welcoming me to better Mars. Chiron's squaring my Mars. He's bringing action from Aries, a sign so associated with Mars, a sign where my natal Chiron lives, though I'm sometime from my Chiron return. He's inviting my Mars to be a better being. Neptune inviting my Venus to be a better, stronger note in my own personal song. And they're doing it simultaneously, along with Uranus opposite the Sun and Saturn opposite Mars and Saturn square Mercury and Saturn square Pluto and Pluto square Jupiter and yada, yada, yada. It's like, right? So sometimes we have this like one thing the most confusing times I'll tell you is when there's no transits, significant transits at all. And you're just like, I just feel like I don't have, I don't know, <laughs> you know, then poof, something comes along. It's like, Oh gosh, I need to figure this out. Wow. I have a wound on my shoulder called Helen. What the heck is that? You know, <laughs> And, but you know, and then a bunch of things happen at once and it's just like, Oh God, they want this from me. She wants that from me. He wants this from me. Ah. And it just brings us into the truth of astrology, which is so beautiful. We're all schizos. We all have, you know, I'm Gemini Brett. I'm a Scorpio, according to sun sign astrology. Right? I am Gemini and Virgo and Leo and Aries and Cancer and Libra. And all of them, as we are all the signs, all the seasons, and sometimes particular notes of our soul songs come alive, courtesy of activations, invitations by these guides and guidesses who say, how do you want to do that? Do you want, says Neptune to my Venus, do you want to remain trapped in any way to some idea that a natal Venus sinister square Neptune at the descendant equals disillusion and confusion and delusional relationships for your life. Is that just the lot you drew? So sorry, friend. Or do you want to receive this invitation and enjoy, perhaps with some pain, the initiation that will invite not only Venus, but that aspect, that seeing to realign in such a way that we now not only have renewed, but found new faith in the beauty of true love. And I say, yes. And I say, thank you for spending some long time in a three-part journey today, storytelling. The theory of phase angle returns, check that out. It's a powerful thing and many ingredients of one sacred stew. The point is not only to honor each ingredient, but as they are all coming together, what am I cooking for me? What are you cooking for you? So you can nourish yourself and choose powerfully to grow. Please give this thing a like if you like it. It helps, you know. Share it around if you really do. Um, and again, if you feel like giving something back for what you've received here today in this long share, I always appreciate those who can support my study and my sharing. You'll find a donate button at morethanastrology.com along with the services link if you'd like to book some private storytelling counsel or mentorship. 
See you in space, friends. Love and planets to you.